I was making the point at the end of our last session that the believer and the unbeliever have conflicting philosophies, have conflicting overall outlooks on the nature of reality and how we know what we know and how we should live our lives. Another way of putting this is to say that the believer and the unbeliever have conflicting worldviews, a term that I know you've heard already uh, in the conference and you're going to hear a lot more before you go home. Let me give you a definition of what I mean by a worldview. A worldview is a network of presuppositions which are not tested by natural science and in terms of which all of experience is related and interpreted. Once again, a worldview is a network of presuppositions not tested by natural science in terms of which all experience is related and interpreted. A person's worldview is a network, first of all. It's not just one belief. It's a whole system of beliefs. But the kind of beliefs we are dealing with when we talk about a worldview are that special variety of beliefs called presuppositions. We'll say more about what a presupposition is later, but for now, suffice it to say that a presupposition is not just any assumption a person has, it's a very fundamental or logically basic assumption. It is, in fact, the precondition of that person's thinking. Because a person's presuppositions about the nature of reality and the nature of knowledge and the nature of human conduct and value, a person's presuppositions provide the precondition for choosing the problems that you consider genuinely problematic giving you a method for discovering and resolving, providing for you the standards of interpretation. Everybody has just such a network of presuppositions. Now that isn't to say that everybody knows they have these presuppositions. And obviously a person can have tuberculosis without knowing he or she has tuberculosis. In fact, a person can have tuberculosis even when they deny that they have tuberculosis. You may go to your next door neighbor, this guy who lives for all the gusto in life that he can get, you know, and uh, try to talk to him about philosophy and say, you know, you've got your presuppositions worldview too. He'll say, no, I don't. I don't even want to think about that stuff. So get away from me. I don't believe in thinking about philosophy. Just give me a beer and turn on the game on the tube. He may tell you that, but he's got his presuppositions anyway. It's just a matter of getting him to think self-consciously about his presuppositions. Everyone's got presuppositions. If they didn't, they wouldn't even know where to begin in the morning. I want you to stop and think about this for a minute. If you had to, when you wake up in the morning, you don't assume anything now. You just have to start from scratch deciding what you're going to believe about life and about yourself. Well, should you sit up in bed, first of all, get dressed, have some breakfast, and then say, okay, now I've got to apply myself to the really tough questions. What is real? How should I live my... No, because you've already decided that certain things are real and that you should live your life a certain way just by deciding to get up out of bed. And how do you know what you know? Are you the same person you were yesterday? Are you the same person you were a week ago or a month ago? And you go down to the table and your mother says, Hi, Johnny. How are you doing today? You just take it for granted you're Johnny. But you see, that assumes that there's personal identity between you, the Johnny of this morning, and you, the Johnny of last week. Now I am sure that you're all sitting there saying, This guy has lost it. <laughs> He's worried about whether I'm the same person I was a week ago? Well, believe it or not, there are reasons why philosophers get worked up about questions like that. But the reason is not that they just get up and uh, this question confronts them. You see, that's the kind of question that comes after you've thought about other kinds of questions that require looking into assumptions and methods, and then they start testing their assumptions and methods 
and they get into deeper sorts of levels of abstraction and finally they ask the kind of things which make people wonder if philosophers are sane at all. But since you think I'm insane, I'll, I'll play the game with you. Then how would you prove that you are the person that you were last week, allegedly? How would you do that? What if I hypothesized that God created the world this morning, he created everybody in it, and created them with the memory bank that you now use as memory thinking that you existed a week ago and that you were doing whatever you were doing according to your memory a week ago. Now you may say, well that's a silly kind of thing, who cares? And maybe it is, but I'm from the land of fruits and nuts and so we um, we're kind of nutty about these matters. I might still say, okay, it seems kind of silly, but then how do you know otherwise? When you get up in the morning, you took that for granted. You assumed identity of your person over time. And that, I want to assure you now, all kidding aside, is one of the most perplexing problems in philosophy. Personal identity. You assumed that memory was reliable. You assumed you could trust your senses. You assumed you should live in a certain way. You assumed that eating a certain kind of food was good for your body or would be pleasurable. You assumed a lot. You didn't explore and discover all those things new every day. Everybody has presuppositions. Everybody has preconditions for living their life, evaluating things, knowing what they know. And when you go off to college and you find people with an antagonistic point of view to your Christianity, what I want you to see is that the presuppositions that that person is using, the worldview that that person is using in opposing your Christian outlook or worldview is going to be the crux for defending the faith. Worldviews when all is said and done, will determine what a person believes and how a person lives his or her life. Worldviews are a package deal. Every particular in experience, everything you encounter, every thought you have, every sensation that you experience, every particular is seen in terms of a broader system of interpretation. A system that allows you to relate one particular sensation to another, or one point of view to another, so that you can start drawing conclusions. And that system of beliefs, that broader system, in terms of which the particulars are related and interpreted, is a worldview. By the way, the fact that Christianity is a worldview has an interesting consequence that goes way beyond how we defend the faith goes way beyond the subject of apologetics. Because Christianity is a worldview, you need to be aware of the fact, and maybe at this conference will be the first time that you have taken it seriously, you need to be aware of the fact that if you are committed to Christ at any particular point in your life, then you need to be committed to Christ at every point in your life. Christianity is not simply about a certain narrow range of human experience, like when you pray, or go to church, or evangelize people, or read your Bible. All of those things are important. All of those things express Christian commitment. But if you are committed to Christ anywhere in your life, anywhere in your experience, then you need to be committed to Christ everywhere in your experience. Which is to say, since Christianity is a world and life view, to be a Christian is to have a distinctively Christian way of looking at reasoning. We looked at that in our last session. But it means you have a distinctively Christian way of looking at literature as well, and human nature, and social relationships, and economics, and politics, and education, and family life, and recreation, and art and industry and everything else that is part of human experience. To be a Christian, to be committed to Christ at any one point, 
means you must be committed to Christ at every point in your life. Because Christianity is a worldview. It's not just one of the many options that a number of different philosophies can tie into. It is basic. It is fundamental. It is logically fundamental so that it affects everything systematically. It is not simply a narrow point of view. Now, if everyone has a worldview, let's stop and think about some of the issues that every worldview addresses. I'm going to try to put some of this up on the board for you so you can keep track of it. These are key issues for anybody's worldview. They are issues that you address as a Christian. If you stop and think about your Christian theology, you'll see that you've got a view on these matters. But everyone else in the world has a certain view on these matters too. In order to uh, lay this out, I need to introduce to you the three major divisions of philosophy, however. And that means that it's going to sound like intellectual bullying unless you tune in just long enough to get the definition of these terms. You need to be aware of these things. You probably haven't learned them you know, up to this point, but it will help you greatly in, in your reading in college to know what I'm talking about. First, metaphysics. Secondly, epistemology. And third, ethics. You've probably heard the term ethics anyway. Metaphysics. Metaphysics studies the nature of reality, the origin, structure, and nature of what is real, of whatever exists. What is the nature of reality? What is the world like? What is man like? What is man's place in the world? These are metaphysical questions. They're not questions about the physical world simply, but that which goes beyond the physical world and accounts for the physical world. And I'm going to give you five questions that at least have to be addressed in any adequate metaphysic, any doctrine of the nature of reality. First is the question of the nature of man. What is man? What's he like? Is man free? Is man basically good? Is man an animal? These are metaphysical questions. Secondly, there's the question of the nature of the universe. What is the origin of the universe? Where did it come from? How did it get here? What's its structure? How does it work? Thirdly, there's the question of the existence of God. So we have the nature of man, the nature of the universe, and the nature of God. Then obviously, what is man's place in the universe before God, if there is such a God? These are metaphysical questions. But two other matters, real briefly, might be brought up. Am I going too fast for you? Man, the universe, God. What are they like? The fourth issue is the question of change or development, often called the question of history. What is history? How do things change? Why do they change? How is development possible? This leads those who are in the philosophy of history to ask, where is history going? Is history going anywhere? Is there such a thing as meaning in history? That's a metaphysical question. And then fifthly, there's the question of the character of laws or concepts or universals. And finally, uniformity. I'll repeat that again. The character of laws or concepts, or universals, or uniformity. If you're going to understand the nature of reality, you have to understand, on the one hand, the nature of change, development, and history, but also you have to understand the nature of unchanging things like concepts, or uniform things like laws, or universal principles, or even the uniformity of the way in which history progresses or the natural world changes. Now I've been talking in a, in a way that's kind of philosophical and will get real boring. But if you stop and think about it, what I've been talking about can be expressed in terms of Christian theology too. 
I've been talking about the doctrines of creation, fall, and consummation. Because we as Christians, hearing the Bible preached to us week after week and reading it every day of our lives, are learning about the nature of man and the nature of the universe and the nature of God and his existence. We are learning about history and where it's going, about the consummation of all things. We're learning about how God regulates the world. We're learning universals and uniformity. We're learning about the nature of man as a fallen being, that is to say, not basically good, and therefore abusing his freedom. And so, in a very real sense, what the metaphysical philosophers are studying is just um, Christian theology in a kind of a secular and in many cases heretical garb. They've got their doctrine of creation and fall and consummation, just like you have your doctrine of creation, fall, and consummation. The reason why many people never bring these things together is because the vocabulary is different. And because it doesn't seem like they're interested in being religious if you interpret religion as very narrowly going to church and acts of ritual or worship. But the fact is they've got their doctrine that matches, answers to, actually competes with your doctrine of man's creation, fall, and the consummation of all things. The second area that philosophers study and about which everyone has presuppositions is called epistemology. Epistemology is one's theory of knowledge. It studies the nature and limits of knowledge and such concepts as belief or truth or knowledge itself and how beliefs are justified. Epistemology is a general theory then of man's knowing how it's possible, what the limits of it are, what methods are to be used in pursuing it. Four particular questions that epistemological philosophers address are these. First, the nature of truth and objectivity. What is the very nature of truth and related to that, the nature of being objective in one's thinking? Secondly, what is the nature of belief and knowledge? What is the relationship between believing something and knowing something. Is knowing something just a case of believing it with all your heart? Or is it something more than that? Is it possible to know something and not believe it? Is it possible to know something and believe it and yet not profess to believe it? These are questions that we ask in epistemology. Thirdly, what are the standards or procedures for justifying one's beliefs? How does one know what one knows? What kind of proof or evidence is acceptable? And then finally, epistemology deals with what might be called science and discovery, the very procedures of science and how they are to be evaluated and in what way they offer standards for discovering more things about the world. Now that again sounds all very philosophical. But in a very real way, people who are studying epistemology are giving a counterpart to what you have learned from Sunday school on as the doctrine of revelation, how man's mind is enlightened by God. The Christian has views with respect to knowledge and the discovery of new truths. The Christian has views about the standards of truth and belief. And those views are all related, in one way or another, to our doctrine of God's revealing himself. Revealing himself not only directly to us in our heart of hearts, but, direct, but revealing himself indirectly through the created order that we are to study and know him better. And then revealing himself, of course, in the words of scripture, the Bible, and revealing himself in the person of his own son, who came into this world as the highest expression of knowing God 
because he was God himself. And so a worldview is going to have a certain epistemology about it. Just like your Christian worldview has a certain view of God's revelation, which characterizes you. And then finally, philosophers study ethics. Obviously, the study of right and wrong, good and bad, attitudes and actions. Ethics. In philosophy, we study the nature of good and evil and language about ethical judgments. What does the word good mean? How does it function? In philosophy, we study the standard of ethics and ethical evaluation. Under the general rubric of ethics, we can place the study of the notions of guilt, atonement, and personal peace. Fourthly, ethics looks at the nature of the social order and the state. And finally, ethics studies how one attains or produces moral character, how one comes to conduct himself or herself in an ethical fashion. So we have the question of the nature of good and evil, the standard of ethics, the question of guilt and personal peace, the question of social order in the state, and finally the question of how we produce or attain moral character and conduct. Now that sounds very philosophical perhaps, and yet you as a Christian have studied ethics the whole time that you've been um, subject to the preaching of God's Word. The whole time that you've been reading Scripture, you've been reading ethical subjects. Obviously the fall of man has to do with ethics why it is that it's now difficult to attain moral behavior. The fall of man has something to do with guilt. Moreover, the doctrine of redemption in the Bible deals with this whole notion of guilt or atonement and personal peace. How is man to find a solution to his personal problems? That is a secular way of putting it. The Bible puts it in terms of how man is redeemed how he comes to have a just standing in the sight of God. So over against these three areas of metaphysics, epistemology, and ethics, I hope that you'll put in another column, if you will, something of the Christian counterpart to many of the sub-questions that we've been looking at, and that is the Christian counterpart found in the doctrines of creation, Fall, redemption, and consummation. We talk about it in different ways, we approach it in different ways, but the substance of what is studied in philosophy is also the substance of what is delivered to us in Christian theology which is what we are committed to because we are followers of Jesus Christ. And therefore, when you go into the university classroom, the professor is not going to encourage you to do this, but you need to take it upon yourself to be asking always, what view of origins is assumed by this man, or maybe explicitly being taught? What view of origins that stands over against my view as a Christian believing in creation? Believing in the self-contained God who needs nothing and who sovereignly chose of himself out of nothing to create the world. What is this person, what is this professor giving me that stands over against that? You need to be asking, what is this person's view of man's problem? Why are there difficulties in this world? That is to say, what is his counterpart to the Christian doctrine of sin and the fall of man? What kind of solutions to men's problems are we hearing at the university? That is, what secular theories of salvation or redemption are we running into? What view of history and the meaning of man's experience is being given that is the counterpart to our view of the consummation of all things. 
Now let me real quickly run through a few examples for you just to show you that other worldviews outside of Christianity address these questions. Think about Hinduism for a minute, another world religion. Do Hindus have a particular view of origins that stands over against the Christian doctrine of creation? Well, they certainly do. In the first place, Hinduism teaches that nothing is genuinely new or real because there cannot be any change. All is one. And what we see in our illusory experience of change is really nothing more but the cycle of life, the wheel of life. And that is, though a very perverse and I think an absurd view of origins, it is the counterpart in Hinduism to the Christian doctrine of creation. Think about behaviorism. Behaviorism as a school of psychology tells us that human beings do not genuinely have freedom but are rather nothing more than sophisticated stimulus response mechanisms. Human beings do what they do because they've been stimulated and conditioned to respond in the way that they do. You all know the story of Pavlov's dogs, right? Pavlov had this experiment many years ago where he'd ring a bell right before he fed his hounds. And he found that after a while of stimulating and conditioning them in this way, that if he rang the bell, even though he didn't put food in front of them, they'd start salivating. And this, in a very um, crude and simple way, is the model that is used by behaviorists to understand all of human conduct. We are nothing more but stimulus response mechanisms, uh, glorified Pavlovian dogs, if you will. Now, does the behaviorist have a particular view of what's wrong with man? Well, he certainly does. He says he's not been conditioned properly. The reason why we have warfare and oppression and injustice all about us is because men have not been conditioned properly. That is, the ringing of the bell and the feeding of the food has not been put together in the right ways to make people act nice to make them act harmoniously and peacefully. And so the behaviorist has his own understanding of man's sinfulness and man's fall. Think about Marxism for a moment, which we hope to see less and less of in history, and maybe we have some reason to be encouraged um, in seeing communism struggle around the world these days. But for many years, it has been a very viable and a very popular philosophy. Does Marxism have a point of view that, that is the counterpart to Christian theology? Does the Marxist have a particular view of the consummation of all things, where history is going? Well, of course, the Marxist does. We believe that history is moving in the direction of a greater conflict between the city of God and the city of man. We see the kingdom of Jesus Christ coming to have ascendancy over all that which fights against it, as every enemy has made the footstool of Christ's feet. We see Christ returning in judgment to separate the sheep and goats, the wheat and the tares, and for all eternity then to confirm people standing either as living with God or being separated from him in hell. We have a certain view of consummation. We know where history is going. Does the Marxist think he knows where history is going? He certainly does, and that's why he sacrifices so much. That's why he's willing to become a member of the party and to give up his own freedoms and pleasures, because he believes that history is inexorably moving toward that consummation, and he wants to be part of that process. He wants to see revolution, overthrow oppressive and capitalist regimes. He wants to see the dictatorship of the proletariat and eventually the withering of the state. Think about existentialism for a moment. Is an existentialist someone who says that people are radically free, they have nothing that controls what they can be or what they are, and they define for themselves the meaning of their existence? Does the existentialist have a view that stands over against Christianity? Well, the existentialist clearly does. According to the existentialist, the nature of man is not to answer to God, 
not to answer to parents, not to answer to school teachers or professors or the state or anybody. Man answers to himself only. And when he fails to understand that, he doesn't have an authentic existence. He is alienated from himself. He is living in bad faith. And what he must do is assert his will and make a choice for himself without guidance from anybody else. He must recognize the absurdity of the universe and that he imposes meaning on his life and it's not given from God or from anything outside him. Now that sounds like a kind of theology, a very perverse theology, a very heretical theology, but nonetheless something that is like Christianity in answering questions about the nature of man and what's gone wrong with man and how man can save, be saved, in this case, save himself. Well, we could go on and on with illustrations, but at this point, my guess is you might be sitting there if you're not thinking about what it is to tamper with a smoke alarm in the airplane. You might be saying, how am I ever going to know about all these worldviews? I mean, Dr. Bonson, you've just kicked these out. Boom, 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 boom. I mean, there's no end to these sorts of things. I'll never be able to master this. Ah, well, maybe you can. I'm going to try to give you a scheme for doing so. I don't intend to mention every particular version of every worldview that's ever been promulgated in the history of man, but I do have what I think will prove a helpful diagram or map of the terrain so that you can kind of get an idea of what some of the major issues are and also become familiar with some of the vocabulary that you'll run into in college. And so I'm going to use the board again here and start laying out for you some of the major worldview options, if you will, that are out there that compete with Christianity. The first worldview that you should be aware of is what is called monism, and I put in parentheses spiritual here because technically materialism is a monistic view of the world as well. But here I'm thinking of monism in the spiritualistic sense. Perhaps the leading illustration of a monistic worldview is Hinduism. According to the Hindu, everything is one, despite the appearances that there's a difference between you and the person sitting next to you, and a difference between you and the chair, and a difference between this building and another building, and a difference between this part of the world and another part of the world. All of that's illusion. Ultimately, the final reality, Brahman, is one. And within Brahman, there are no distinctions. And it should be your goal in life, according to the Hindu, to try to achieve that mindset of oneness through meditation. If you don't, well, then when you die, you're going to have to come back again and live your life until you finally learn your lesson. But eventually, if uh, you go through enough cycles of life, enough reincarnations, you will become enlightened, and upon death, you will, like the drop of water in the endless, shoreless ocean, completely lose yourself in the oneness of being. Spiritualistic monism. It's not a material one, it's an immaterial, or if you will, a spiritual one. Now, that kind of worldview is not simply found in Hinduism, but I would suggest that before you go to college, or if you're already in college, you pick up a book that has at least a chapter on Hinduism, maybe a whole book on it, and read it. I guarantee you it will be worth your while. If you do that, you'll be able to deal not simply with what is strictly called Hinduism, but you'll be able to deal with all of those which are Hindu-like religions, Hindu-like worldviews. The Hare Krishnas, for instance. Christian science, for instance. New Age theories, for instance. 
All of them are but variations on, I know they're insulted to hear this, but it's true, all of them are philosophically a kind of Hinduism, a kind of monistic, spiritual monistic view of the world. A second kind of worldview can be called dualism. If monism means all of reality is one kind of thing, what is dualism? It's going to be the view that reality is made up of two kinds of things, matter and mind, flesh and spirit. And examples of dualistic worldviews would be, first of all, idealism. I think here particularly of the philosopher Plato, but whether people know the technical aspects of Plato's philosophy or not, there are many idealists who think that beyond the physical realm of time and space, there are ideals or ideas that exist in and of themselves. Idealism holds that there is a, a realm known as time and space, but then there's something which is beyond time and space. Many idealists tend to be intuitionists when it comes to epistemology and ethics. Whoa, now that vocabulary is rolling in there pretty hard. Let's look at that sentence again. Tend to be intuitionist in terms of epistemology. Their theory of knowledge is we intuit the forms we know certain things as rational concepts that are innate to us or intuitionists when it comes to ethical ideals. Ethics can't be justified, it's just something you intuit, they will say. These are forms of idealism. Another kind of dualism is found in what I call Stoicism and Moralism. The ancient Stoics held that man lives for the sake of duty for getting his life in connection with and in harmony with the way the universe is moving, the rationality of the universe. And it's an obligation for him to do it, to live with a stiff upper lip, to submit to the necessity of the universe as it is. And more generally, moralistic points of view that tell us that man is to live according to certain ideals or certain duties in this world even though we recognize man is made of flesh and blood and lives in a physical surrounding, there's more to him than that. Moralistic worldviews. Now we're going to get more complicated here. We have monism, dualism. A third basic worldview type is atomism. And here I mean atomism in the materialistic sense. The idea that Reality is made up of matter that can be broken down into atoms, the smallest building blocks of the real. There are a lot of different varieties of atomism, more than I can mention tonight. You need to be aware that when Democritus and Epicurus of old maintained that reality is made up of an infinite number of atoms, they were not using the term atom in the way that we here in the 20th century say in the Bohr model of the atom. They didn't have any such concept as that whatsoever. The only reason I tell you that is because it's one of the most remarkable pieces of ignorance that I've run into that in physics classes people will say, well this point of view on the universe is something that comes from the ancient Greeks. That's straining it a great deal. Atomism in the materialistic sense is the view that the material world is all there is, there ain't no more. There is no realm of ideals or values or forms beyond this world. There's no God beyond this world. And certainly, it's a denial of monism, the idea that reality is a spiritual one that runs through all things. The atomist says everything breaks down into little building blocks of matter. Now within the atomistic or generally materialistic perspective on life, you're going to find a division having to do with whether there is any kind of freedom in this world or not. You have deterministic theories 
that are materialistic or atomistic. And then you have theories which are not deterministic, but I'm going to give a little bit more definition to that. That is theories that say man does have a free will that can be exercised in a particular way. And particularly man's free will is to be exercised in pursuing pleasure, what we call hedonism. Among the materialists, or the atomists then, there are those who hold to the notion that man is not genuinely free. There is no genuine freedom in reality. Two examples you've already heard about tonight. Behaviorism says that individual human beings do not have free will. They are Pavlovian dogs, white rats, stimulus response mechanisms, robots. There's no individual freedom. More broadly, Marxism is a deterministic, atomistic view of the world. Marxism says the only thing that's real is matter. That's why a definition of Marxism that's often given is uh, helpful when we say it is dialectical materialism. The idea that matter is evolving and developing in a dialectical way throughout history. Everything is matter, and the Marxist holds that all of history is deterministic. All of history is moving according to certain laws, the dialectic, and will have a uh, predictable outcome just because of that. Those who are atomistic in their view of the world are materialistic, however, have not all always agreed on this question about freedom. There are those who hold to materialism and yet say man has a free will. Of course, was the view of Epicurus of old, who was perhaps the most modern man of the ancient Greek philosophers. Epicurus said the world is made up of an infinite number of atoms that are controlled in everything that they do, and yet man, who is made up of these atoms, should live for pleasure. Now, I hope that there are some budding philosophers out there who are awake enough to say, what? Wait a minute. If man is made up of matter, and therefore he is controlled just like weeds growing are controlled and natural forces are controlled by these laws of nature, then how does man choose anything at all? It doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. Well, we can't dwell on that very long. Unbelievers don't make a whole lot of sense once you get into their philosophies and Hopefully you'll start taking that for granted. What I want you to see, though, is that this kind of unbeliever who is a materialist said that people make choices. They should live for pleasure, hedonism. I'm going to give you three forms of the free will version of materialism. First of all, egoism. Secondly, utilitarianism. Thirdly, existentialism. First of all, egoism. The egoist says we should live for pleasure, and he means by that individual pleasure. Live for yourself whatever is good for you. You have a sophisticated version of this in the philosophies of uh, Ayn Rand and John Hospers and others who are libertarians. Egoistic pleasure. Or you could choose if you believe that this is a material universe and there's nothing but matter and yet men are free. You could choose that we should live for the pleasure of the greatest good of the greatest number. Not individual pleasure but the pleasure of the group. And that is the philosophy of utilitarianism. Utilitarianism says the way we live our lives should be governed by what makes the most number of people happy. And it comes to expression in the political and economic theories of socialism that tells us that basically man lives as a social creature and for the happiness of his society. And then finally, and this is straining a bit to put it under hedonism, but in the free will approach, to the material universe that man lives in. The existentialist, as we mentioned a few moments ago, says man must exercise his free will to define for himself what he will be. He just exists as a material object, but then he freely gives himself an essence, freely gives himself a character, and determines the outcome of his own life. There's only one more, so don't, don't get too tired now. We're almost done. 
The map is almost complete. In addition to monistic, spiritual monistic theories of reality, knowledge, and behavior, dualistic, that is to say idealistic or moralistic approaches to life, and atomistic, materialistic views, there are those people who say nobody can know for sure. So you have pragmatism and skepticism. You have those who say there is no knowledge of ultimate reality available to man. The pragmatist says, therefore, we should live for solving problems. It makes no difference whether we have a theoretically adequate account of what we are doing. The only thing that counts is that we are able to adapt to our environment, solve our problems, and get ahead in life. The pragmatist eschews the traditional problems of philosophy, therefore and says it's not important that we pursue those. We don't need to know about things like certainty. All we need to know is about utility, what works. The skeptic goes even beyond the pragmatist. The skeptic uh, says we can't know anything at all. In fact, you'll find people in the university who make their living from the university and take a paycheck to be professors of that which man can know and what's best for him in the traditional sense and yet they are skeptics they don't believe that what they are doing in the university amounts to a hill of beans and that's why you'll find a great deal of two other attitudes that are related to skepticism here sophistic attitudes and cynical attitudes in the university by sophism uh, while well, I'm referring to an ancient Greek school of thought that said that no one can know anything for sure and therefore what you should do is master arguments to persuade people of your point of view. That isn't to say your point of view is true, it just means that since there isn't any truth you might as well try to get as much as you can out of life. So master how to win arguments from which we get the English colloquialism, a sophism means a trick of debate or argument that doesn't have genuine substance or reliability. There are plenty of sophists at the university, and they'll be found primarily in the law school. Those people who are taught to win arguments for the sake of money, regardless of justice and regardless of truth. The most important thing is that you are the hired gun for somebody, and you've got to get what they want. Their acquittal, or in some cases, they, their... Um, going after somebody else. Lawyers often will go from one side of a social issue to another from case to case depending on who's paying the tab. They're nothing more but modern sophists and you find that not just in the law schools but you find it throughout the university. People say well no one really knows so what you need to do is learn how to get ahead in life. And then of course there are those who are the cynics um, if I weren't a Christian, I think I'd be a cynic, to be very honest with you. I find it hard enough even as a Christian not to be a cynic. But the cynics look at all of this and say, no one really knows. There are all these customs of the establishment and tradition, and it's just a bunch of hooey. No, there's really no basis for living a particular way or not living a particular way. And so why all this put on? The ancient cynics got their name from the Greek word for dog because they uh, advocated uh, copulating in the open, as dogs do. That's not because the cynics actually practiced that, by the way. It's because they were trying to offend their culture, as many in the hippie generation and others have done, tried to offend the establishment by saying, you don't have any standards that should govern us at all. It's almost like, let's get back to nature. You know, you, you have the Mother Earth approach here. The cynic who says establishment, mores, civilization is what corrupts. And uh, so what we can do is what is most natural for us. Well, that's it. I, I don't pretend that this is going to do the trick 
with every single point of view that you run across. But I do think that it will be very helpful for you if you write this down and before you go to college and maybe, you know, for a number of weeks into your courses, you keep thinking every day as you go to class, what kind of worldview am I getting here? A materialistic worldview? A pragmatist worldview? Am I getting an idealistic worldview? And then in addition to that, and then tomorrow when I speak to you, I'll pick up on this point. In addition to asking what kind of worldview, you should be asking yourself, what does Christianity say about that? What does my Christian theology say about these issues pertaining to creation and fall and redemption and consummation? How do these worldviews stack up against each other? And then eventually you're going to want to know how can we show that one is right and the other is wrong? And I hope to do that before we're done this conference as well. But that'll be it for this evening.